Good evening. Welcome to Registration 101, the first of our webinars this summer to help our incoming first year students get set for the upcoming academic year. Our webinar this evening will be hosted by Dean Michael Mason, Assistant Dean for First Year Students, and Dean Lynn Marie Hamill, Senior Associate Dean of Undergraduate Studies. I am Nancy Diulio, Assistant Dean of Undergraduate Studies, and I will be taking your questions via email to be answered live on air. If you have a question, please send it to summerregehelp at case.edu with the subject line, Info Session. If we do not answer your question live, we will follow up with you shortly via email. Now to your host, Michael Mason and Limri Hamill. Well, good evening and uh, welcome to the first of our online information session series for this summer. Glad you could join us. Thanks for welcoming us into your homes and onto your computer screens, your mobile devices, whatever they may be. Um, and we're glad you could be here. My name is Michael Mason. I am the Assistant Dean for First Year Students in the Office of Undergraduate Studies. And here with me as well is my colleague, uh, Lynn Marie Hamill, who's the Senior Associate Dean in the Office of Undergraduate Studies. And together tonight, we're going to uh, do our best to provide you with information that you can use to help get started in the process for exploring course options for the fall, understanding a little bit more about academic requirements, and building your way up to actually creating a schedule and registering uh, on July 11th. It's coming up in just about a month from now. So glad you could be with us, of course, as uh, Dean Diulio mentioned. Uh, if you have questions tonight, please send them to summerregehelp at case.edu. Um, that'll be our ongoing uh, email address throughout the summer for you to send questions to anytime you, you have a question or need something answered. Um, but tonight, specifically between seven and eight, um, the questions that we get from you to that email address we'll use to answer those live on air. So anything that you're thinking about, concerns that you have, kind of burning questions, uh, definitely send them our way. So we do have uh, some kind of specific learning objectives or uh, goals for the evening, some things that we want to cover. Um, we're going to start off by talking about some important dates and deadlines. And we'll just review those with you so you understand kind of where we're at in the process. Uh, Dean Hamill's going to talk about degrees and majors, kind of what those are, how they work, basic structure there. Um, we'll talk about our general education requirements, which are also called SAGES. Um, we'll talk specifically about some of the resources that we've created for you to help you with the registration process. Uh, we'll focus on our FYR guides, first year registration guide, um, which is actually now available to you on the new student checklist. Um, finally, we'll talk about how you actually go about the process of registering for your classes in, in July. And then, of course, dedicate a lot of time this evening to answering your questions. So again, if you have questions now, uh, feel free to go ahead and start sending those in. If you want to wait and just kind of send them in as, as they come uh, to you, feel free to do that as well. We're happy um, to kind of take them either way. So what we'll do now is kind of move on to the uh, important dates and deadlines. Again. Uh, you know, the, the, we'll start off with just some things that are happening in progress and then things that you'll be building up to, and I'll let Dean Hamill talk a little bit more about those. Thanks, Michael. Um, I, yeah, so welcome, uh, everybody. We're glad that you're able to join us this evening. I do want to review some of the important dates and deadlines that are up and coming. As Michael said, there are some that are in progress right now. Hopefully you've already requested that your AP scores or IB scores um, have been sent to, to CASE. Um, if you haven't done that yet, uh, the deadline is coming soon and there's information on the checklist as to who you need to contact and uh, where you need to send the information. And you should also have been sending in all of your college, um, the evaluation of college credit if you've taken things um, pre-college scholar-wise and uh, trying to get transfer credit for it. There are some paperwork and forms that we need to have um, completed in our office in order to give credit. Uh, and again, we've been getting lots of it from people, so I know people have been checking the, the, the checklist, uh, and we've been updating your uh, specific list as we get the, um, the information that we need. The other big dates that are up and coming are July 1st, and these are ones where you really need to work on your math diagnostic test, um, if you need to take that, your writing sample, um, the foreign language placement test, and that's only if you really need to take the foreign language test. If you're not planning on taking a foreign language, you don't need to do um, any of those tests. 
And then it's the information for advisors. And this is really important for us and the advisors because it gives you a chance to tell us a little bit of, about yourself, what you're excited about coming to school, what you um, may have questions and concerns about. And then um, the advisor who you'll meet when you first get here will be able to help you with some of those questions. Uh, the big days will be July 11th to the 16th, and that's when you'll actually be able to go into the student information system and register for your classes. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that as we go through the, um, the, the seminar today. Um, July 17th to the 26th, um, us, the, the people in undergraduate studies and um, the deans and our great student workers uh, will be reviewing all of your schedules, um, making sure everything looks, it looks fine, and we'll be contacting you if there's any problems. And we'll be also notifying you on the checklist when everything is, um, is set. And the last um, kind of important deadline or date that you need to be aware of uh, comes in mid-August. And this is when we'll be um, working with you to get your SAGE's first seminar placement. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today and in future sessions. So those are kind of the dates and times that you really need to be aware of um, in the next uh, month or so. Okay. So you're going off to school and you're thinking, okay, I need, I'm getting a degree. What is a degree? What is a major? What are all the components um, that make that that make up um, a degree from Case Western Reserve? I'm going to give just a very brief overview of what you'll need to do to satisfy some of those requirements, and you'll be able to find out more about it, um, you know, in the uh, first year registration guide when you talk to your advisors um, as you start getting more involved in your departmental or your uh, major um, classes and so forth. But we kind of have it broken down to four components. And one is probably, we can look at it, the, we say we have the credit hour, residency, and physical education requirements. These are requirements that all undergraduates have to fulfill. There's a minimum number of hours that you need to graduate is 120. Some may go up to a little bit more. Um, I said, and you do have to do all of your, at least 60%, or not 60%, half of your, half of your classes, so that's really not 60, that's more 50, um, have to be done <laughs> um, at the university, and you do need to do a physical education requirement, and again, I said, that's something all undergraduate students have to do. The SAGES and general education requirements, those are almost more school specific. Um, for the most part, they're similar to every undergraduate student. Um, you'll see your seminar classes um, will be the same no matter what school that you're in. Uh, but the breadth requirements um, may be a little bit different depending on what school you're in. Then you'll go and do your major requirements. And those are really, um, again, by program or major. And those are going to vary significantly depending what major you're in. You know, what you take as a psychology major obviously is going to be very different from what you take as a biomedical engineering major. So those are going to be a very much kind of major specific. Um, and then the last part are the open electives, additional majors or minors. And this is really going to depend on the major that you're doing. Some um, in arts and sciences have a lot fewer hours that you need to do to complete your major. So if you are, for example, a psychology major, that would be 30 hours that you have to do. Your SAGE's requirements come out to be about 30 to 35 hours, depending on which ones you have to take. So those two don't add up to that 120 hours that I said that you need um, to graduate with a degree. So people in major like that are going to have more time to do open electives, maybe add a second major, or have a minor. So that part is really kind of individualized to the student. Depending on your major and the type of credit you have coming in, um, you're going to have more time to do um, open electives. So again, that's just kind of a very general um, overview of what a degree is and what a major is. And again, we went from very kind of broad-based um, broad um, discussions, what everyone has to do, to SAGES. Again, it's very broad-based and exposes you to lots of different um, academic disciplines and, and classes in different areas that you might not necessarily think about. Majors are much more kind of specific to what you're interested in. And then again, the open electives are going to be you know, things that you really want to take and interested in. So I think that's just, a, we'll kind of leave it with that. If you have more questions, you'll be able to follow up with us um, on that later on. To talk a little bit more about SAGES. Um, SAGES for us is, you may have heard a lot of people talking about their general education requirements in school. Um, and what we talk about, when we talk about our general education requirements, we call SAGES. And that is a seminar approach to general education and scholarship. Again, these are um, classes that focus on a wide variety of skills and knowledge bases, critical thinking, um, communication, skills that we think all CWRU undergraduate students must have in order to graduate. Uh, then, and it's really kind of broken down into two, con two parts. Um, there are your seminar classes, which are really small classes, um, really focused on um, 
small group discussions, presentations, writing, critical thinking, um, persuasion, uh, and, and more along those skills um, that you'll do in your stages classes. And you can see um, there's the first seminar, university seminars, departmental seminar, and your senior capstone. Seems like a lot. What we're going to focus on tonight is just the first seminar because that's the class that you need to take in the first semester of your freshman year. And the other kind of part of stages are the breadth requirements. And these are the classes that are there to kind of give you, uh, to expose you to the diversity of various academic disciplines. We want you to have some experience in lots of different areas. You know, we don't want you to coming in being an anthropology major and taking 95 hours of anthropology and not being exposed to any other type of, um, of discipline. So this does, um, this kind of, it kind of requires you to kind of you know, expand your horizons and, and um, you know, dip your toe into various disciplines. And you, know, you may come out with a different major or minor that you, um, that you never would have thought of ahead of time. So that's kind of what our, stage, our general education requirements are. Uh, and again, there's more detail about it in the first year registration guide. And you'll be able to talk to your advisor about them once you get on campus as well. So now we'll take some time just to kind of highlight uh, what's in the first year registration guide. You heard Dean Hamill talk a lot about it. Um, I mentioned it in the, in the early part of the presentation tonight. The first year registration guide is meant to be kind of a comprehensive uh, tool that you can use to help understand more about what the academic requirements are here at Case Western Reserve. Um, it'll also give you an opportunity to not only, you know, try to figure out what it is that you need to take for a particular major that you have in mind, um, but it also, I think, is a really good tool for exploration. It gives you the opportunity to browse through all the different uh, degree requirements that are, um, that are required for different majors. It gives you an opportunity to look through um, different course offerings for first year students, um, different scheduling information for students who are interested in pre-professional programs or study abroad. Um, all these kind of things that you can use to help really get a better sense for what's available to you here at the university. So looking at just kind of what are some of the things that we want to focus on tonight to help you get started. Uh, one of the big things that you're going to find uh, helpful to you within the guide is going to be schedule recommendations. So for each major, we've put together a sample schedule for both fall and spring semesters. So the sample schedules you'll view, you'll notice that you know, they're kind of designed to be you know, starting out from the beginning. We know that some students have credit for certain courses, either through AP, IB, things like that. Um, so we've included special sections on how to choose uh, the correct course sequence. So for those of you who are taking courses like calculus or physics or chemistry, you know where to start in those sequence. There's uh, pages de dedicated specifically to fi figuring out which of those courses to start with. Also within the schedule recommendations, you'll find some notes, some advising notes, um, for each major that kind of talk specifically about things that you might want to do um, as you're thinking about creating your schedule and gearing it towards a particular major. So Dean Hamill and I will show you more kind of specific examples of how that works, but again, that's something that we think will be very helpful to you. Um, also, as Dean Hamill mentioned, you know, it, it does outline the different general education requirements, kind of divided up by the different schools in the College of Arts and Sciences. So depending on which of the you know, different programs you're thinking of, you can look at the general education requirements that go along with that major and get an idea of uh, what kind of general education courses you may want to look at taking in the fall. Um, we've compiled some frequently asked questions. Um, we've collected a lot of questions over the years, both through the information sessions, through our Summer Edge Help email. So we've tried to address some of the more common questions uh, in the FAQs. So you might want to read through those first and just kind of get a sense of, you know, what kind of information a lot of other students are asking, and maybe some of the questions that you have could be answered by those frequently asked questions and answers in that section. Um, there are also information about some enhanced course opportunities. Now, the enhanced course opportunities are available to uh, students by invitation, depending on their backgrounds. Um, so there's enhanced courses in physics and calculus. Um, one thing to think about as you're considering um, these enhanced courses is that um, the, the term enhanced shouldn't be interpreted to mean that um, these are better courses um, or something like that. These are just different types of calculus and physics courses that students can choose to take depending on the kind of experience that they want to have in those classes. They tend to be a bit more on the, on the theoretical side. Um, they kind of go a bit beyond um, what your standard calculus and physics courses would offer. 
um, in terms of, again, kind of the theory and conceptual things. But they're not necessarily for um, or best for every student, even those who, who are invited to take them. So you can read about those, but if you're um, invited to take them, you can learn more and, and think about how you might want to you know, consider whether or not you want to pursue that opportunity. Um, the shopping cart is something else that's really you know, explained very well in detail. Um, the shopping cart is kind of like what it sounds. You know, if you've shopped online and you've you know, gone to a website where you, you know, pick out items that you want to purchase, you go to check out at the end. It's kind of a similar concept. This, this tool actually allows you to kind of shop through the schedule of classes, you know, identify courses that you want to take, uh, put them in your shopping cart, and with the shopping cart, you can actually look and find out more about, you know, when are the courses offered, um, you know, what are the prerequisites, what are the course descriptions, how do these things all fit together. There's a, a validate feature in the shopping cart that allows you to kind of check to make sure that there aren't any time conflicts or if there's prerequisites for the course that you've met those prerequisites. So it's just a way to help you with the course planning process. Something that we strongly suggest you start using now um, and definitely in advance of registration because it'll make your registration that much easier. Um, finally, there's just information about some of the uh, other things that you can do in addition to this, the you know, standard schedule recommendations for your specific major. So those of you who are interested in things like musical ensembles or if you're playing a varsity sport and you want to register for that so you can get physical education credit, uh, physical education courses, study abroad opportunities, research, pre-health requirements, all those sorts of things are outlined in the first year registration guide. And the guide is kind of designed sequentially so if you start out in the beginning with some of the introductory materials, it'll eventually kind of you know, move you into some of the more specific uh, course information, schedule information, schedule recommendation tools that you can use to really build uh, your schedule for the fall. And the goal here, both through this guide, through all the resources we're providing you through these seminars, these, these online information sessions, is to help you feel comfortable, confident, ready to uh, take care of registration. And of course, you know, as you have questions along the way, hopefully you'll be contacting us either on the phone or at our Summer Edge Help uh, email address because we'll be here to answer those questions for you. So I've explained all that. Dean Hamill's talked about you know, some of the kind of bigger picture requirements and you may still be asking yourself, well, how am I gonna know what to register for? Again, you know, use the guide. Um, use the online information sessions. But before you even get to that point, you know, you want to spend some time, if you haven't already, just thinking broadly about, you know, what are your academic interests? You know, what are the sorts of, you know, things that you enjoyed most um, studying when you were in high school? What are some of the, you know, longer term goals that you have for yourself, whether they're, you know, career interests or study interests? Um, what are some of the things that you know drew you to Case Western Reserve in the first place? You know, there are a lot of different things to consider as you're as you're thinking about academic interests. But ultimately, what you ideally would like to do um, is to design and a schedule and, and an academic experience for yourself in the fall that really reflects where your interests and your passions lie and is helping you work towards your goals. Um, and for those of you out there who are not decided. There's also a section in the first year registration guide that specifically addresses uh, undecided students. So, you know, you don't have to know exactly what you want to do when you go to register. You just kind of have some ideas and use the tools that are out there to help you generate a schedule that'll work. Um, as I mentioned, the sessions, the guide, um, consider what kind of credit you have. You know, if you have AP, IB, um, college transfer credit, you know, you want to think about uh, how those will play into your course selections for the fall. Um, our general recommendation for students is if you have credit that's a prerequisite for a course at the next level, um, that you, you go ahead and try that next level course. You know, some students may choose to eventually you know, go and, and repeat something they already have credit for and, and they're free to do that, but we think that it's best for students to really kind of try, try out a course at the next level. You've, you've earned the credit, you've kind of met the requisites for the course, you know, go forth and give it a shot. You have the first two weeks of the semester um, to drop ad period to really, you know, test drive a course, so to speak, before you're really committed to it. So use that as an opportunity to explore. Um, the schedule of classes, like I said, you know, once you go and uh, download the first year registration guide from the new student checklist, you'll see a link to SIS, uh, the student information system, which is the, the system that we use 
for course enrollments and also just kind of a academic uh, requirement management and things like that. Uh, you can go into SIS and you know, start to explore the schedule of classes, see what courses are offered, see what time they're available, read the course descriptions. And like I said before, you know, number one, I think above all else, as you're using all these resources that we provided for you, is just to ask questions. You know, our goal in, in the Office of Undergraduate Studies is to support students and help them make the most of their educational experience. And that's what Dean Hamill and I are here for. And, uh, you know, everyone else at the university, the orientation staff, the faculty, staff in the various offices across campus, you'll find that they have that same helpful approach. So when in doubt, when you have a question, just ask and we'll be here to help. So let's get into more of the sample schedule. I'll let Dean Hamill talk a little bit more about how you can use these schedules to, to help develop some schedules for the fall. Thanks, Michael. So what we have on the screen now is a sample schedule. Um, if you want to be an aerospace engineer, we just randomly chose an engineering department, and here we have it. Um, I know from last year these didn't come out really well on screen, so we wanted to show what it looked like just in the FYI guide, but I want to zoom in a little bit more, um, so hopefully you can see this a little bit better. So what we did is we worked really closely with all of the departments um, to kind of to help you to kind of identify the classes that um, you would need as a first year student. So everyone uh, needs to take a SAGES first seminar. So that would be the first class that you'd want to look at um, as an aerospace engineer, but really for any major. Um, then we have a math course listed, a, ke a chemistry course, and a physics course, um, or ones that are really important that you take the first semester. And then a phys ed activity course or a varsity sport. Um, if you are a varsity athlete, you do want to register for that class, as, as Michael mentioned earlier, in order to get um, phys ed requirements or, um, satisfied. Uh, and we do like you trying to get your phys ed activities done. You do have to take a year of phys ed. Um, but if it's not available, if it conflicts with something, um, don't worry about it. You'll be able to take it um, sometime before you graduate. But if it does work, um, we try to, you try to get into your schedule now. So if you're looking at this and say, okay, this is great, you know, this is what I take as a first year, it says Math 121. Now you're sitting there thinking, hmm, well, I got, you know, uh, I've already got a 5 on my Calc BC exam, so I don't need to take Math 121 anymore. What should I do? And this is where you go further down onto the schedule to see what some of the sample advising notes would be. And we just gave a snippet, for example, the ones that are here for aerospace engineering. So if you do already have credit um, from AP for Math 121 and 122, we tell you what math to take instead of that Math 121. So again, if you do have a 5 on the Calc BC exam, you can go into Math 223. Uh, we also give suggestions about you know, if you do have AP credit for certain classes, what would be the next class that you could take? So hopefully between the schedules that we have there, if you don't have credit, which is perfectly fine, a lot of students don't, but then ones who do have credit either through AP, IB, college credit, um, we kind of help move you along working with the department saying this would be the next logical step and the step that a first year student or the class that a first year student should take um, if, these, you know, if, if you already have credit for things. So hopefully that will help you, you know, answer a lot of questions as you're figuring out what you need to take um, as you're putting together your schedule. And we're going to turn it over to Michael to look at um, a schedule from someone who's looking at arts and sciences where things may be a little bit more flexible than if you're in the School of Engineering. Thanks, T. Hamill. So yeah, when we're looking at a, a different kind of schedule here. Um, this is a sample schedule for a psychology major. Um, and again, this is just kind of a uh, two-semester snapshot of what a typical psychology major might be looking to take in those first two semesters. But we will zoom in here and focus on the first semester. Um, so again, you can see kind of compared to, uh, say, an aerospace engineering major, the psychology major has a lot more um, options in the first semester. So you have, again, Sage's first seminar, which all first year students are gonna take in the fall. Um, in this case, you have an introductory course, Psych 101, um, that uh, students are recommended to take to explore their interests and also to you know, open up opportunities to take upper level psych courses in following semesters. But then uh, the rest of the schedule is filled out with some general education requirements. Um, these are spe specifically breadth requirements um, within either arts and humanities, global cultural diversity, natural mathematical sciences, social sciences. So this is where looking at the general education requirements for your particular school or college, in this case, the College of Arts and Sciences, is going to be really helpful because when you go and you look at the general education requirements, you can find out you know, what are the courses that would satisfy a uh, arts and humanities breadth requirement versus a social science breadth requirement. Um, and once you've figured out 
which of the courses will satisfy there, then that's when you go into the, the recommended first year course offerings or you go into the schedule of classes and you start to see, okay, what courses within those areas are available to me in the fall. Um, start reading through the course descriptions and really, again, try to make an effort to, to find courses that align with your interests. I mean, we see time and time again, students that perform best in their courses um, are the ones who are really interested in what they're learning about. Because when you're really interested in what you're learning, you know, you come to class ready to discuss, ready to take in information, ready to contribute. Um, but also, you know, learning feels like a really enjoyable, fulfilling, engaging process. And that's what we're looking for. Um, again, you know, you look through the, the course grid and that gives you kind of a general outline. Um, but as you scroll down after the grid, you'll see some, some sample advising notes there. And again, in this case, you know, the recommendation here would be if you're going to you know, pursue psychology as a major, go ahead and take Psych 101 in the fall semester. It's a good way to get an, an overview of the discipline and also gives you the opportunity to, to advance in the second semester and beyond. And in this case, you know, again, because we do have some students who've either taken a college level psychology course or they've taken AP Psych, um, if you have credit there, it gives you a list of courses that the advisors in the Department of Psychology uh, recommend as appropriate first year courses, or excuse me, appropriate courses for a first year student uh, to take in the first semester beyond Psych 101. So again, use the grids and use the notes to help give you an idea of how you can interpret the grids as they are in their existing form to fit your unique uh, situation. I'll turn it back over to Dean Hamill so she can talk more about just kind of the tools that we use to help with registration. Thanks. So we have talked a lot about what um, what the tools are that are going to help you register. And again, um, we talked about SIS, which is a student information system, and you really become to use that uh, a lot of times. This is where you're going to find all of your information. Um, your class schedule will be there. If you have AP credit that's, you know, that you have that's posted or transfer credit, you're going to be able to see all of that um, online in SIS. And this is where your shopping cart's going to be and the actual enrollment process is going to take place. So you really want to make sure that you get to be familiar or you learn to become familiar with the student information system. Again, the FYR guide is really helpful. Again, we try to lay out you know, as, as um, you know, straightforward as possible you know, what classes to take for each major with the, you know, advising notes. Um, we will have, I said, more webinars um, for the next two weeks. Um, Michael and I are doing the ones um, today. We're going to have ones just on pre-health, and we're also going to have, over the next two weeks, um, faculty from a lot of the different departments, from humanities and social sciences and engineering, talking about their majors, um, you know, what requirements they have, and again, answering your questions throughout the, um, throughout the time. So use that. And then um, through undergrad studies, we mentioned before, you know, we'll be here all summer to answer any of your questions. Um, you know, Summer Ridge Help at case.edu and our phone number. We're going to wrap the thing, our kind of talking up here now. I think we're getting some lots of questions in. So hopefully um, we've answered some general questions for you at this particular time. But now we want to hear what questions you have and things that we've, we've missed. So hopefully we've got some questions waiting for us. Again, if you haven't emailed it in yet, summerridgehelp at case.edu. Okay, great. Thanks for that uh, very comprehensive information. We have actually a, quite a few questions coming through and some questions about AP scores. So I'm going to give you a couple of those to get our question and answers started off. First of all, from Emily. Emily's question is, will we know right away if our AP scores are accepted? Yes. Um, what will happen with AP scores is, you know, as long as you've gone through the checklist and you've completed the steps necessary to make sure that Case Western Reserve will receive your scores when they become available, um, what happens for, for exams that were taken this year in May, um, we get a large data file um, from the College Board in early July um, and we upload that data file to SIS and as soon as we get that information, um, those credits, those those score, those scores that you received will be translated into actual course credits for the courses here at CWRU. So you'll be able to see once they're posted, which again will probably be early July, um, 
they'll be able to see those posted both in SIS and on your new student checklist. Your new student checklist uh, should show um, the scores that we received for you for AP. Great, thank you. Another question from Ben about AP credit. If I have AP credit for a course not required in my major, how will that AP credit count toward my degree? That's a good question. Uh, again, depending on what your major is, you're going to have more open electives. Um, so any, co any course that you take and have credit for is going to count towards those 120 hours or more that you need to graduate. So if you are a sociology major and you have credit for um, a geology course, it's not going to necessarily count towards your major, but it will count towards those 120 hours you need to graduate. And it may also count towards one of the breadth requirements that we've talked about in the SAGES um, and general education requirements. So a lot of people do get um, you know, credit, um, their breadth requirements taken care of by the uh, hard work that you did in high school and taking all those AP courses. So yes, it will count towards um, overall credit hours towards graduation, even if it's not for your major. Great, thanks. I have a different question. If I'm out of the country during the registration window from the beginning of July up until July 22nd, what can I do in order to get my registration taken care of properly? That's an important question because we know that some students won't be available during that July 11th to 16th window. Um, so if that situation applies to you, uh, what we ask is that you send an email to summerregehelp at case.edu, which it sounds like you've already done because we've got your question, and uh, we will follow up with you individually to work out an arrangement to help you complete the registration process. We do have a process in place for helping students who aren't going to be available during the actual July 11th to 16th window. I have a question from Alexandra. She has taken pre-calculus in high school and wants to know if she can take Math 125 this fall and how to find out what textbooks she'll need for her courses. Uh, if you've taken pre-calculus, um, uh, again, we, we base whether you take a calculus course or not on the math diagnostic. So if you haven't, um, so if you've gone to the checklist, it should tell you if you are exempt from the math diagnostic and placement exam at this point. Um, if you have at least a 650 on your SAT or a 28 on your ACT, um, you do not need to take, um, uh, you, can, you don't need to take pre-calculus, you can go right into a calculus course, and depending on your major, maybe 125 is the correct one. Um, if you have in place, if you don't have those um, score, those test scores, if you do take the, um, the math placement test, it will tell you if you need to take pre-calculus to go into a calculus course. Um, if you do get into the pre-calculus course here, which is um, Math 120, you will be able to take, um, during that first week of classes, another placement exam to see you know, if you're maybe just nervous or didn't have a good test day um, the day that you took it. So you will be able to retake the exam that first week of classes. But if you don't have calculus and you do not have an AP score or the requisite t um, test scores, you will need to take the math placement test um, during the, uh, before July 1st. And as far as the, the textbook information is concerned, uh, once you register for your classes, uh, you'll be able to actually, there's a link in SIS on the, uh, cert, excuse me, on the, um, on the schedule portion where you can actually see your schedule of classes. There's a little link on there that says, you know, something like buy textbooks. I can't remember what it is exactly. But it'll take you to the CWRU uh, bookstore website um, where it'll automatically plug in your course registration information. It'll tell you which courses, uh, excuse me, which textbooks are required for the courses that you're enrolled in. If you just for fun want to take a look and see, you know, what textbooks are required for courses you think you're going to enroll in, you can always go to the CWRU bookstore uh, website and just, you know, search through the um, textbook information for the different courses. And again, it's just all sorted out by course. Um, faculty will communicate directly with the bookstore to let them know which course, or excuse me, which books the students will need uh, for the courses. And I just want to give a quick plug shameless plug to the the section of the FYR guide that specifically talks about how to select a math course. It's actually kind of a step-by-step, -step, you know, how to uh, select a math course, yes or no kind of questions that should guide you to the right answer. And again, of course, if you have questions about that, just email Summer Edge Help and we'll, we'll help you the rest of the way. 
Great, thanks. I have another question about diagnostic exams from Daniel. Daniel is exempt from the math diagnostic exam, but not the English. Why is this? Well, all students have to take the writing diagnostic. There's no exemptions given for that. Um, so this is part of the process of helping your SAGES instructor to get a better sense of kind of where you're at as a writer. And again, you know, keep in mind that your SAGES courses are going to be capped out at 17 students. So the faculty member who's teaching that course is going to get to know you very well. And it's nice for them to be able to, to kind of get a sample of your writing before you come on campus so they can get a sense of how uh, kind of where everybody in the course is at with their writing and, and gear sort some of the instruction toward you know where they see that some students may need development. Um, there are cases where you know based on your writing sample you may be um, uh, recommended to take a Sages for Seminar that focuses more on writing development. So uh, everyone submits the writing diagnostic, no one's exempt, um, and it's important that you know as you do that writing diagnostic that you you know go forth and, and put the full effort into it so they can get a, a good sense of where you're at as a writer. Great, thanks. I have another question from Zayun. What's the maximum number of credit hours a student can register for each semester? And what's the minimum number of credit hours a student needs to register for to be in full-time status? Good questions. Um, the most the student can register for in their first year is 19 hours. Um, but when you go to trying to register for classes now, um, you'll only be able to register for 15 hours. And this is because we're putting a, um, everyone needs to take their first seminar class. So we're, uh, we're holding four hours of credit at this particular point. So 19 hours is the most that someone can take in their first semester. We do usually recommend 14 to 17 hours as being the optimal number of hours that you should take in your first semester, um, knowing that some people may go above that, but 14 to 17 is pretty much the optimal number. And going forward, there are um, ways to take some additional credits um, in following semesters, but it is based on, on your performance and what your GPA is, your overall cumulative GPA. Um, so people can take more than that, but in your first semester, it, it would be 19, knowing that you've registered for 15, and then we will actually put you um, into a four credit hour SAGES class um, going forward. Right. And at the minimum number of hours you need to be considered a full-time student is 12. Um, but as Dean Hamill said, you know, you might want to take some time to look at the, the SAGES first seminar registration process information in the first year registration guide because it will explain to you that, you know, when you first go to register for your courses on July 11th, um, you'll just register for everything except first seminar during that window. And then after registration is closed on the 16th, then you'll be contacted by SAGES with a list of first seminars that fit with your existing schedule and from there you'll indicate uh, some seminars that you'd like to be enrolled in and eventually be placed into one of those seminars. As long as we're discussing SAGES seminars, I have a question from Nishant. Do SAGES classes contribute to our GPA or are they supplemental educational seminars without any grades attached? Yes, they do factor into your GPA just like any other course does. Um, and so, you know, the first seminar is a four credit course and it's letter graded A through F just like any other course. And so um, whatever you end up getting in that course is going to contribute to your overall GPA just like a four credit hour calculus course would. Another question about AP scores from Kimberly. Kimberly notes that it's past the date to send in my AP and college credits. Is it all right to send them in anyway? Absolutely. Um, the, the, the AP scores won't get to us until the beginning of July. Um, the date, uh, you need to request that they be sent here, but even if, you, even if it's late, we cannot post any scores for you until we get those, um, the AP scores. Um, so I would suggest that if you haven't already done so to go through ETS, again we have it on the checklist, what you need to do to request the scores and get them sent in. 
Um, if for some reason you know, they can't get here, but you have a copy of your score report, um, you can send us a copy um, of your, score, your official score report to summerridgehelp at case.edu, and we can use that as well. But it's really important to get your AP scores in, one, to give you credit, and secondly, if you're looking, if you need any of those courses um, for prerequisites for other courses, you cannot move along in that progress and in, in that procession until we actually get your, your AP scores or IB scores. And as far as the, you know, college credit evaluation, the, the deadline for that was on June 1st. Um, but if you have college level courses that you'd like to have evaluated, we will still accept those. You just need to get those to us as soon as possible. So go on the checklist, download the form, send us the form with your guidance counselor's signature on it, get us the, the, the transcripts and the course descriptions ASAP. Again, you know, looking at making sure that we have time to evaluate those courses and post the credit in advance of registration so that if you need to use any of those as prerequisites, um, that they're in the system for you so the system um, will allow you to register for a course that you need a prerequisite for. Okay, a different topic. Sir Srivastan wants to know, do enhanced courses mean honors, and is there a biology honors course, and how would he be invited to take part in those enhanced courses? There are no honors enhanced uh, biology courses. Um, they're really not honors courses. As Michael explained earlier, they're, they're more enhanced, and they, they cover different topics. And for example, in um, physics one is physics one. They cover a lot of the same classes, but the enhanced course may um, may be more, more theoretical, less computational, and again have kind of a different um, different twist to it. So whether it's in the calculus or physics courses, um, again they're not honors. You don't get additional credit for taking those. It's not it's not marked as enhanced on um, your transcript. It just says calculus one or calculus two, whatever it is that you take. And again, and even if people are invited to take that course because it's really based on different test scores and, and, and so forth. It's not always the best option for everybody. There'll be a lot of times that um, you know, people have done really well in their math and physics courses and did really well in AP and have high SAT or ACT scores and they're going off into you know, engineering. Uh, maybe not the theoretical part is what they need for those classes. Maybe it's more the computational part. So it's really not about you know, being an honors course. Um, it's really, you should look at it as these, are they covering topics that I'm really going to be interested in with the kind of more theoretical um, twist that they're going to have to some of the other courses. But they, were, they are only in chemist, or sorry, in physics and in math. There is none for biology. Great. I have another, a question about the language placement exams. Would it be a good idea to take one of the language exams even if one is not sure if he wants to take a language course? I think so, absolutely. I mean, if you're not sure at this point, I would just go ahead and take the exam so that you have an idea of kind of where you should start. You know, even if you're not planning on taking a language in the fall, it still could be beneficial um, to get a sense for what level would be a good place for you to start if you want to maybe wait till the spring. Now with that in mind, if you're thinking about taking a language, um, you may want to look at you know, the course offerings because um, not every level of every language is going to be offered every semester. Some of them are more sequential. So 101 and 201 and 301 may be only offered in the fall, whereas 102, 202, 302 are offered in the spring. Um, so if you're playing with the idea of taking a language, um, you may want to start as soon as the fall. In other cases, you can wait till spring semester. You can even wait till your second year if you want. Um, but the results that you get from the placement exam now might be more, you know, relevant to where you're at at this moment in time as opposed to where you'll be a year from now. The, the kind of, uh, I guess, qualifier to that statement is that, you know, as I mentioned before, the first two weeks of the semester are the drop ad period which means that in those first two weeks you can add and drop courses as you like to fit your schedule or you know, to look around and, and find out other you know, courses that might be better suited for you. So in the case of a language, say you, you know, register yourself for Spanish 201 um, because that's where the placement exam said you should start um, and you get into Spanish 201 and you realize that it's either too advanced or you know, it's very familiar to you and you'd like to move up, you just have to have a conversation with your instructor. 
they are all kind of anticipating that there's going to be some movement in those language courses in the first two weeks. So they'll recommend that you either, you know, move down, move up, or in some cases maybe just, you know, stay at the level that you're at. But your, your professor will be more than willing to, to work through that with you. So you should feel comfortable going based on the information you get from the placement exam. Um, or if you're not taking a placement exam for one of the languages we don't offer a placement exam for, there's some recommended kind of general criteria for selecting a level. Um, just feel comfortable scheduling that for now, knowing that you can make adjustments once you get here in the fall. I have a question from Olivia. Olivia has been looking at the class schedule for next year and noticed some courses are scheduled only 10 minutes apart. Can I sign up for classes in different buildings with only 10 minutes to get there, or is that a bad idea? Oh, that's very astute. Some people don't realize, you know, the time difference um, right away. Um, a lot of the classes are like that. Um, you know, people do get from one class to the next class, you know, within those 10 minutes. It may make it a little bit more difficult if it's, you know, totally across campus. So sometimes looking at the campus map to see, you know, how can I get from one place, you know, to the other in 10 minutes. But for the most part, people are able to do that. We do kind of help facilitate getting across campus. We have a great um, security guard that stands in the middle of our busy section stopping cars and, and you know, or getting people across the street. You'll meet Officer Mark when you get here. Um, but it, it makes it, I mean, a little bit more challenging. You have to make sure you, you know, don't lollygag in between classes. You need to kind of get up and get going. Um, but you can, do, you can do the 10 minutes, and that's not, um, that, that's something that happens on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And again, you can use those two weeks, um, as Michael talked about with the ad drop. You know, if you're 10 minutes late for class every day that first week, maybe you need to look and see, you know, I need to take this class another time, and that 10-minute time frame is not going to work for you. But for the most part, um, students do know they have 10 minutes to get to class. Mm -hmm. Hi, I have a question from Jill and also several other students. What do I have to do to send my AP scores to Case? Are there forms to fill out or is there a place on the checklist that can help me determine how to get my scores sent to Case? So when you took your exams, um, if you took any this past May, you know, when you were filling out your, your test packet, it, it should have asked you you know, I think it gives you up to five schools that you can indicate that you'd like to have your results sent to. Um, so hopefully you did that already, and if you did that when you took your exam, then there's nothing more to do. It, the process will happen automatically. Um, if for some reason you didn't do that, and that's when you need to get in touch with uh, the college board, and I would recommend doing that as soon as possible. You know, go to their website. They should have an 800 number on there that you can call. Get in touch with somebody. Um, as soon as you can because you know the reason we set June 15th as the deadline on the checklist for that item is because after June 15th uh, the, the college board won't be accepting from students um, new information about where to where to send those exam scores um, so if you've done it already or if you didn't even take an exam this year but you took one last year um, and you indicated a case as a recipient then you're all set um, our, our code is 1105, if that helps. Um, but, you know, that should be all, all ready to go. And again, if, if you didn't do that, contact the College Board. They'll walk you through the rest of the process. Um, and if you have complications from there, just send us an email uh, to Summer Edge Help, and we'll work with you to make sure that we get those scores posted when they become available so you can be all ready for registration. Okay, I have a different question from Emily. Emily wants to know, if she decides to change majors, can she change her schedule, and when can she do, do that? Um, Emily, it's perfectly fine. Lots of people change majors. Um, you know, it's you do have the first two weeks of classes to, you know, to change um, classes th uh, for the semester. I really don't like to have people wait for two weeks um, to change classes. I really like to have them the first week because if you wait until the end of the second week, you've missed two weeks of classes. Um, if you're really unsure, so I'm not sure if the question's coming from, I'm totally unsure what I want to major at this point, so if I start one thing and, and go, you know, what, or and change my major, that, and change my mind that first week, um, or if you really have lots of different things out there, uh, I think I would, I would recommend looking at the different classes that are out there um, you know, if you do want a whole scale change, you can do that. 
but just remember something that you take in your first semester um, is still going to probably count towards over, it's going to count towards overall credit hours. Um, your first seminar, no matter what major you're in, is going to count. Uh, as we talked earlier, a lot of the breadth requirements in Sage's courses are the same throughout the um, throughout the school. So whether you're an engineer or a nurse or in weatherhead or in arts and sciences, so. Um, think about the class that you really want to take at the outset. You know, think that these are really what you want to do. If you do want to change that first semester, that first week of um, classes, your advisor um, can surely help you do that. Um, but just know that you know, if you go and you know, choosing something, then there, it's not really right for you. You know, stick it out. Know that you can you know, use those classes towards other majors and other degree requirements. And you can look at you know, changing something um, after you do a little more exploration on campus to another major. So you know, once you're here on campus, you'll be able to talk to the departments to see you know, what, what, what it's like to be a major, uh, you know, a, a political science major, meet some of the faculty, see what the classes are like, you know, explore a little bit more, maybe talk with the career center if you're really unsure what direction to go to. So yes, you can totally change your major um, that, you know, those first two weeks of classes. We'd like it to be that first week, um, but you know, it's definitely you're not, this is not set in stone what you register for um, in July and you can change when you get here. I think, you know, not to, to belabor the logistical aspects of it, but you know, after the, the July 16th, you know, we, we suspend students' access to, to SIS so that we can go and, you know, um, review their schedules and also so that the, the SAGES for seminar placement process has an opportunity to play out. Again, because, you know, you're, you're getting a list of first seminars to choose from based on your schedule as it exists as of uh, July 16th. So if, you know, somewhere after the 16th, but before you get here on campus, you have kind of a, you know, an epiphany and you realize that you don't want to be, you know, a certain major anymore and you want to change to something else that would require kind of a wholesale schedule change, you know, you would just get in touch with our office and we could help you with that. Um, but otherwise, you know, one of the nice things about our orientation model is that very early on in orientation, you will meet with your advisor first in a group setting on Tuesday, but then on you know Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday of that orientation week, you'll sit down with your advisor one-on-one -on -one to kind of review things again. And so if at that point you want to you know, change a course here or there, um, or even if you do need to make some larger scale changes, your advisor will be able to help you with that and you'll be kind of given full access to SIS again once you get here for orientation. Okay, since you just mentioned advisors, Dean Mason. I have a question for you from Daniel. Daniel wants to know what kind of information should we let our advisors know and what would be most helpful to them to know about us? Well, I, I think that's an outstanding question. Um, Dean Hamill, if you want to interject, <laughs> feel free. But I think, you know, first of all, you know, again, thinking about from an academic standpoint, an interest standpoint, you know, what are you interested in in general um, is helpful. Um, but they probably want to know more about you as a person, you know, so what kind of things, do, I mean, and it may seem trivial to you, but what kind of things do you like to do for fun? You know, um, what are some of the values that you hold kind of most near and dear to your heart? You know, what kind of guides you in your kind of day-to-day -day work, your day-to-day your -day interactions. Um, you know, what kind of plans do you have for yourself at the university? You know, do you plan on getting involved with certain kinds of organizations? Do you um, plan on getting involved with research? Or do you want to pursue, you know, internships and co-ops? Do you want to uh, get out and volunteer in the community? Do you want to study abroad? Um, all those kind of things I think could be really helpful to an advisor and getting a sense of, you know, not just what you want to do as a student, but just who you are as a person. Because as you'll learn, you know, the, the more you can share with your advisor, the more personal relationship you can build, the more, I guess, intimate a relationship you can build with your advisor, the more effective the entire advising relationship is going to be. And I don't know if you have anything to add, Dean Hamill, or? I think those are really good points. Um, so again, what you want to do, what you want to be, but if there's anything that you're concerned about, you know, mm -hmm. that we might be able to help you. If you know that you have, you know, time management issues, or you know that you might, you know, you may be homesick, you know, when you get here because you haven't been away from home, 
or there are other issues that, that might you know, impact you, you know, talking to us or letting your advisor know at this point, we can kind of help direct you to the right resources and support networks and things that, that are here. So sometimes kind of opening up about things that you're a little bit concerned about mm -hmm. as opposed to, in addition to the things that you're really excited, excited about are really good things to let your advisor know. And again, they're really confidential um, letters, so, they'll, um, so they're not out for everybody to see. Um, so your advisor will have that information. Um, but again, it's going to help us help you once you get here. Absolutely. Great. I have a question from Marissa. For the nursing program, does one need to apply to the program? Students don't need to apply to the program. I mean, once, once you're admitted to the university, I mean, in any way, I mean, as you're admitted as an undergraduate student, you're free to study any of the majors and programs that we offer here. Um, but if you want to be a nurse, if you weren't originally admitted as a nurse, then you'll want to let us know as soon as possible so that we can tell the nursing school that you're planning on being a nurse because the nursing curriculum is, is a bit different than other the curricula that we offer here because there are clinical experiences that you'd have to get started in and the sequence of courses is very structured. So um, if you haven't done that yet, if, you're, if you haven't let Case know that you want to be a nurse, do it now. There's no restrictions on who can do it, but we just need to know so we can get you set up and, and going in the right direction. I have another question from Marissa. Marissa is interested in IM sports, and another of our emails was interested in club sports and wants to know if those will count toward the physical education requirement. No, unfortunately, Marissa, those don't count towards the physical education requirements. Um, we do have a lot of, we have a very active um, IM uh, participation on campus, and uh, when I leave my office at night a lot of times in, in the nice weather, and sometimes not so nice weather, you see lots of people out there playing IMs um, year-round. They'll be outside, and then there'll be indoor ones um, in kind of the colder weather. Um, but the phys physical education requirement is really a class. It needs to have an instructor and graded and so forth. So the um, you, we really can't. We really don't use the IMs and the the club sports uh, for physical education requirements, unfortunately. But there are lots of tons of things out there that you can do, from rock climbing to swimming to jogging um, to cycling that's out there to, uh, that you can do to fulfill your phys ed requirements. Okay, we have about four minutes to go, so I have one more question, and I'm sure after we answer this question, Dean Hamill and Dean Mason will remind you all where you can find the FYR guide. So our last question for the evening comes from Sri, and the question is, is foreign language a part of CASE's general education requirements? I plan to major in the biological sciences. Do I have to take a foreign language as well? That's a good question. The, um, we do not require um, that students take a foreign language um, here at, at CWRU, but if you have studied a foreign language and are studying it now, I, th I think it's a really, I'd really think about maybe continuing on. There's so many things that people can do with foreign languages at this particular point. If you end up wanting to study abroad um, sometime in the future, it may um, open up more possibilities of where you can go if you know that language. Um, looking at graduate schools and, and just how interconnected and how global, globalized the world is coming, continuing on with a foreign language I think is, is really important um, that, that you can do. Um, it's also, um, you know, if you like the foreign languages, that does count as a breath requirement for an arts and humanities, so that's something that you could kind of get, you know, bonus questions for. You can, you know, learn another language um, in addition to fulfilling a requirement. So it's, it is not required, um, but I think you know, it may, if it's something that you'd like to do, you might want to continue you know, studying it um, just so you do have another language behind you and does maybe open up more possibilities in the future. As far as the uh, registration guide goes, um, I'm trying to work off memory here, so forgive me if I'm wrong, um, but there should be a section of the new student checklist um, in, I can't remember exactly what it's called, if it's called advising and registration or something like that. But it's the same section of the checklist where you have your, you know, placement exams and, um, you know, foreign language placement, math placement, stuff like that. There should be a, a section in, there should be a tab within that section that's called first year registration, maybe, or something like that. <laughs> uh, and if you open up that item, there should be a link to download the FYR guide as a PDF. And then once you download that FYR guide as a PDF, then it will show you 
magically uh, the link to SIS so you can get in there and start uh, filling your shopping cart and exploring course offerings for the fall. Um, and before we wrap up, I think we want to talk quickly about our upcoming online information sessions because as I said before, this is just the first of many yes. to come. So uh, tomorrow we have our pre-health what you need to know session with uh, Dean Diulio, whose voice you heard tonight, and also Stephen Sugar, who's our Director of Health Careers Advising. Um, this starting next week, running through the next two weeks, uh, we have the various uh, focused, academically focused webinars that are going from arts and sciences, engineering, nursing and weatherhead, um, broken into different areas based on the arts and sciences and engineering majors that are associated. So as I said before, you know, Use this as an opportunity to explore. Tune in for all of the webinars that you'd think uh, you'd like to learn more about. Um, but certainly, if you can't tune in live, remember we'll have our archives available usually within about 24 to 48 hours after broadcasts on the new student uh, portal page. Um, so where you went to see the schedule tonight, when you go back there in the future, you should see under each of those um, different webinars listed a link to the archive, the YouTube videos. So you can scan through, you can fast forward through all my boring banter and get to the good stuff that'll help you get ready to register. So, I just want to point out one more thing about on the um, information sessions. The one that says Arts and Sciences Performing Arts for June 17th, this one's a little bit different than the other ones um, that are more major specific. We have a lot of students in all majors um, get involved with music ensembles and theater performances. And, and, and all those types of things. So the arts and science, I mean, the arts and sciences performing arts one is really for people who maybe want to major in those, but you know, do minor um, in some of those or continue on again with marching band or chorals and, and you know, all different types of um, performing arts that, that are there. So I'd really encourage people to look at that if you've done those types of things um, in the past as well. Um, so I think we are kind of running out of time mm -hmm. here. So we do want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. I hope you found that it was um, helpful. Um, and like I said, it will be online uh, for you to watch if you need to watch it again. And again, we tried to answer as many questions as we could tonight. We will respond to any questions that we didn't get to um, tonight. We'll email you back in the next um, day or so. And again, throughout the, uh, the summer, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us um, at, um, at Summer Ridge Help or I'm um, in the undergraduate studies office. And again, thanks for, thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you.